all the way from Satan Island. Yes, you guessed it, John. Hello. Hi, Jay. Hello, John. <laughs> Thanks very much. Jay, you know, it uh, doesn't surprise me that uh, Bill Clinton has lifted the ban on trade with Vietnam. After all, the U.S. military was more of an enemy and a threat to Bill Clinton. And, uh, you know, I love that typical political cutesy angle he put on his reasoning for this traitorous act. He said, quote, this is the best way to try to find out what happened to the rest of the MIAs. Talk about trying to take credit for a disaster. And I wonder if one of those MIAs was the guy who had to take Bill Clinton's place when he dodged the draft that now he's so suddenly concerned about. And, and why should we now help a country, Jay, that killed 58,000 Americans right, right. because they didn't believe in our way of life? They rejected democracy and capitalism. Right. Now they want that same system to bail them out? Right. Isn't that uh, proof that uh, our opposition to communism was the right thing to do because it's an utter failure? Right. And I thought, Jay, when we got out of Vietnam, everything would be all right. We were the problem. You know, when they admit that communism is a failure and reject it, then we can have normal relations and not before. And I want to correct a couple of uh, statements that I heard about an hour ago that Lynn made. First of all, Prince Sihanouk of Cambodia was not neutral. He always said he was. Right. But uh, somehow the North Vietnamese were always able to use Cambodia Correct. as a supply and staging area and arrest area for the enemy. But, uh, I mean, for their troops. But uh, Sihanouk kept uh, warning us whenever we got too close to the Cambodian uh, border. Now, the left in this country didn't protest the North Vietnamese ignoring Cambodia's neutrality. But they had plenty to say when Richard Nixon did the right thing and incurred not invaded Cambodia to destroy the enemy's ability to kill American soldiers. But that's why the left wing is upset. They wanted Americans to die. And Lynn speaks of big, uh, big business in this country, Jay, as though they're all right wingers. Big business in this country doesn't rep represent true capitalism. It's the everyday schlub that goes to work and puts his talents to work to earn a living for his family and then and then and then and then is ordered to bow down to his to his master who puts a bullet in the back of his head Did like that. marlin chin yeah yeah well you know i'll tell you i hope the hispanic community is wait you know they usually side with black racists against whitey i hope that they're learning their lesson this why aren't these being called racial murders uh, it beats me. Let me tell you something else, John. With respect to Vietnam, you would know better than most. You're a pretty modest guy, but how many months did you spend in those jungles dodging punji holes? Uh, Thirteen. Lucky thirteen. Thirteen months you were there, and uh, you were an infantryman, weren't you? Yes, uh, and a gunner on the uh, helicopters, yeah. Yeah, and now Vietnam, uh, judging from NBC News' broadcast tonight, is one of the poorest countries in the world, and they want us to bail them out. Yeah. What a what a shallow performance. This traitor, this coward, this draft dodger, mm. this leftist, this visitor uh, visitor to Moscow at the height of the Cold War. This man who lends a this this male version of Jane Fonda. This man yeah. waits waits a year, a cosmetic year. Uh, to to recognize the trading status of South v of Vietnam, there is no more South Vietnam, but more about that in a minute. He let a year go by because he he knew, even though he was chafing at the bit to do this, he knew that if he had done this the day after he was elected, the way he did with the with the uh, gays in the military, he probably would have been impeached forthwith. Right. He well, put on this phony thing that well, well let me wait a while. Right. Let me, right. Let me. And it's funny. What hollow irony, John that he makes this decision and this announcement one day after his phony, lying, crooked commerce secretary is cleared by that phony investigation. Yeah, yeah, I, I wonder if they're going to let go. See, they, they didn't let go of uh, Iran-Contra, but uh, when one of his boys and a minority is responsible for helping an enemy that killed 58,000 Americans, then all within six months they come out with this, the, the lie that they couldn't I, find anything on him. No, they were just afraid of being called racist wait, because wait. Ron Brown is black. Well, well no, but, but Ron, Brown, it, uh, Ron Brown is really not black. Ron Brown is, is an oppressor of blacks. Are you forgetting who his main client was? Mm. Papa Doc. <laughs> he was the point man. Hypocrite? He was the point man in the United States. His major client for his PR firm was Papa Doc himself, the iron-fisted tyrant of Haiti. And then after Papa Doc, he represented Baby Doc, who had to flee, if you recall. 
Yeah. So Ron Brown is no friend to blacks, and he's no friend to Haitians. And he's no friend to America. And I've got news for all those blacks out there who hate white so much. Uh, there was a um, there was a talk show on the other day with with a black woman who uh, revealed that okay. seventy percent of blacks in America have white blood in them. All right, John. I guess John, they can all go kill John, themselves all right, now. Stop. Now you, you, you don't spin off. Don't spin off. Get a hold of yourself. <laughs> uh, listen, I want you to listen now because I'm I'm replaying the investigative report from last night. Uh, did you hear it? On Al Sharpton? No, I, I heard right. about it. Then get to your radio. I'm playing it right okay. now. We're going back to the report on WABC. Okay. Now, ladies. From a loan shark, and then he chases you down and threatens you to pay. And it's his money that you've got, and you're not paying it. That's extortion. But a guy to whom you owe absolutely nothing comes over and demands money of you, and that's freedom of speech. What's the difference? Why does a loan shark get away with it? Why does a, no, why does a loan shark get railroaded? Why does a, a loan shark get nailed to the wall? And why does the, the beggar, why does he get the protection of the First Amendment? If what's good for the goose is presumably good for the gander. But no. You know why? Because the, the loan sharks don't have as effective, as energetic a lobby in the halls of government as do the indigent, troublemaking, nuisance beggars. The loan sharks are less politically correct than the beggars because the, uh, the loan sharks, many of them have the misfortune to have had progenitors who were born between somewhere between the British Isles and the Ural Mountains, which is, of course, the, uh, the staging grounds for all world problems and animus, i.e., that place of dread, that garden of Gethsemane named Europe. And so the loan sharks, having emanated from European people, they, do not, they are not accorded the protection that the courts afford to beggars who are very frequently descended from other areas of the world other than that pernicious place of deviltry known as Europe, that most despised of all continents. So freedom of speech is to be awarded Apparently, if we, if we looked at this objectively, we'd conclude that freedom of speech is to be awarded only to people who are on the far left and who are non-European in their heritage. Freedom of speech is another thing if you happen to be to the right of center politically, and particularly if your progenitors, no matter how many hundreds of years before, had the misfortune to be born somewhere between the British Isles and the Ural Mountains. Uh, and I'm particularly subject to the onslaught of those who would limit my speech. There are people who fear me. They fear me because they know that I have a, a, a knack for putting the truth in a humorous way. And it's very funny, ladies and gentlemen. They say that one picture is worth a thousand words, and very often one bit of political satire is worth 1,000 serious monographs, because ridicule gets to people. Humor makes the point very often more effectively than a turgid political diatribe. And so it seems to be the case that if you use humor to make your message, the deceivers of the left and the racial arsonists who have made New York City and largely the entire United States a viper's nest for the last 10 to 15 years will get their backs up and they will want to suppress you. The very same individuals who demand free speech for Khalid Muhammad would like to shut Jay Diamond up. Make no mistake about that. If you think I'm just being, I'm just glorifying myself, you're sadly, sadly mistaken. I'm not all that important, but there are a lot of other people like me from coast to coast who are fed up with the way so-called justice is applied to one set of individuals and to another set of individuals, and they are speaking out more and more, and it's scaring some people. It's making a lot of people who have become entrenched in their arrogance very, very nervous. And you see, they're not accustomed to feeling nervous. They are accustomed to making you feel nervous. They're accustomed to scaring you. They're accustomed to accosting you on the street. They're accustomed to shouting outside of your home. They're accustomed to shaking your, their fist in your face. And when some guy comes along 
or some several people come along who shake their fists in their faces, well, they're not used to that. You're not doing your part. You're not cowering. You're not running away. You're not acting like a scared little mouse at the Jackson Laboratories in Maine and crawling into your, your place. You're not taking your... You're not, you're not assuming the position. You know what I mean? You assume the position when you bend over and you're ready to be whipped like a, like a, uh, a whipped cur. And a lot of people don't like the idea. A lot of people in the community don't like the idea that I haven't bent over and assumed the position. And a lot of them are getting scared that fewer and fewer people are comfortable assuming that position and are, in, and are standing up. They are rebelling against their position of bending over, waiting for the slaughter, kneeling down, waiting for the bullet, the gun barrel to be applied to the back of their head. A lot of people who have been in that position of kneeling down and waiting for the usurper to put the gun barrel to the back of their head are suddenly standing up. They're realizing what, what was said about Freddy Krueger in the Friday the 13th series. Is that it? Friday the 13th? Is that where Freddy Krueger... Yeah. You remember at one point, I think it's Karen in one of the films says, Freddy only has the power you give him. Well, you know something? Farrakhani only has the power you give him. Khalid Muhammad only has the power you give him. That's right. Sharfman, Albert Julius Sharfman, only has the power you give him. These people, are, they, they go into epileptic seizures when the person who's supposed to bow down to them suddenly stands up, like Popeye, after his spinach. And I'll be your spinach. After you hear me, you'll be like Popeye. You'll be strengthened. And you'll take that thing that's been bullying you and you'll smash it. I'll give you the strength to do that. I'm like a big plate of spinach. And you're Popeye. And you've been bending down. And I'm going to give you that spinach. And you're going to stand up. And you're going to fight for what is right. Because you have every right to do that. And all of these people... Barakan, Khalid Muhammad, or a Sharfman, a C. Vernon Mason, the whole bunch of rabble are suddenly experiencing something they haven't experienced in their 10 to 12, 15 years in the public eye, a rebellion against their lies. And they're disoriented by it, they're frightened by it, and they want to stifle it, they want to silence it, because they're scared, they realize their jig is up, it is over. Their day has come and gone. The American people have swallowed the spinach, are standing up, flexing their muscles, and they are talking back, and they are fighting back, and they will not be stopped in this noble enterprise. And so the merchants of fear, the merchants of fear from coast to coast, the merchants of fear who shake you down in the subway or shake you down in the street or follow you into your home, and their ideological guides in Congress or in activist organizations in every street corner. They are now the ones who know what it's like to cower. They're cowering, be, be, they're cowering in front of that can of spinach that you've just swallowed, and the metaphorical name for that can of spinach is the truth, and it's making you strong, and you're getting stronger. And in their panic, the troublemakers the people that would dissolve the United States of America and see us reduced to the rubble of anarchy. In their panic, they know nothing other than to attempt to silence you. At the same time, protesting their right to speak and defame you. See, they have a right to speak, but you don't. They actually believe that because for 15 years, a cowardly society has encouraged their arrogance by assuming that bent over position. So they assume you're going to continue to play your part. And when you show just the first signs of strength, the first signs of respect for yourself, the first stage of your own rebellion, they're in a panic. This has never happened before. Nobody's ever fought back. Let's shut all these people up. Yeah, but we have to shut them up, but we have to keep speaking. The First Amendment. The First Amendment applies for us and not for them. Well, you can easily understand how they might have, have garnered that false notion because de facto, in practice, for the last 15 years, 
They have had the freedom of speech, the protections of the First Amendment, but you haven't. And so they're very uncomfortable when I speak and when other people speak. Well, I got news for you listening from coast to coast, whoever can hear me now, certainly in the metropolitan area. You will not shut people up. This newfound plate of spinach, these ideas will not go away. And these ideas, ladies and gentlemen, will save America and save our families. On WABC, this is Jay Dunn. That something, Jeff. After you speaking, don't think because after speaking, they say, Mike, what are you talking about, Jeff? You don't think I that tell you, you, you know is something, you, can... you know something, Jeff. After talking to you, I want to send a contribution to Farrakhan. Why is that? What is there about you, Jeff, that makes me want to send a contribution to Farrakhan after I speak to you? Can somebody please call me the, to give me the address? I, I got my checkbook out, and I'm motivated after speaking to Jeff to write a little check out to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. There's something about the way you talk, Jeff, and the way you're aggressive, Jeff, and the way you don't listen to anybody, Jeff. All right, let me get a hold of myself. But uh, the fact, what I was trying to say to this, this ignoramus is that if Pat Buchanan were mayor of New York City in August of 1991, Yonko Rosenbaum would live tonight. Ask yourself this question. If Patrick J. Buchanan were mayor of New York in August 91, would Yonko Rosenbaum still be alive today? I tell you the answer is a definitive yes, because Patrick J. Buchanan would not have hesitated, would not have flagged, would not have quailed in response to a massive civil insurrection, i.e. a riot in front of his eyes. It would have been immediately suppressed. So, Jeff, your question should be, if Patrick J. Buchanan, should I vote for Patrick J. Buchanan if he doesn't want to allow me to play golf with him in his country club? Well, if your ego is so flawed that you need everyone in the world to positively love you, or everybody to invite you to his party, then that, that is your business. I can't argue with you. But I don't need everybody in the world to bow down to me and to love me. What I would like is leadership, locally and nationally, that is strong and that believes in at least some sense of civil justice. And Patrick J. Buchanan's response to the events following the Los Angeles riots were more closely attuned to my own thinking than any other public figure that I heard comment. I can assure you Patrick Buchanan's response to the LA riots was more to my liking than the sniveling response of George Bush, who assumed the position and uh, opened up his wallet and said, here, take my $1.3 billion, just let me live. I don't believe that take the money and let me live is responsible public policy. And I think that's one of the reasons George Bush lost. At least unconsciously, I think a lot of people in the United States felt less safe with him because he, he bowed down, assumed the position, spread eagled, and said, whip me, take my money, but let me live. I don't ask permission to be allowed to let live. I'm like the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. I demand justice. I enforce justice. I don't beg for it. I don't cringe for it. I don't need Minister Farrakhan to repudiate Khalid Mohammed. I don't beg. I don't live and die. I don't wake and sleep hoping that Reverend Farrakhan will repudiate the world. What do I care what he thinks? He's irrelevant. I'm more powerful than he is. You're more powerful than he is. Just recognize that and act like it. Don't act like a cringing little whipped cur. Act like an American man or an American woman. Weakness begets weakness. Strength gets respect. I would not have cowered in, news, in the newspapers and demanded that Reverend Farrakhan repudiate Khalid Muhammad. What if I would know that it would be meaningless anyway, and I could care less what he thinks or what he repudiates. All I want to do is win. That's all. I'm not interested in, I can't change that guy's mind. There's nothing, there's no mind there to change. You might as well reason with a, with a rabid pit bull as reason with Khalid Muhammad. 
come, let us reason, Khalid Mohammed. Please do not hate me. I beg you, Reverend Farrakhan, please play me the violin and do not hate me. I, I, my fragile little weak ego needs your love, Reverend Farrakhan. I don't need your love, Reverend Farrakhan. I don't love you and I don't want your love. Just stay out of my face. That's the way I talk to Reverend Farrakhan. That's the way I talk to Khalid Muhammad. From strength, not from sniveling weakness. That's what I love about Israel. The Israeli defense forces don't beg their enemies to love them. They assert themselves and they do what has to be done. Can you imagine? Can you imagine those individuals in the mosque? Uh, in mosque number seven, that that place of suffering, that place of torture, that place of murder where Philip Cardillo was murdered in April of 1972. Can you imagine if a raid had been staged on that mosque by the Israeli defense forces, by their elite commandos? Can you imagine those, those, can you imagine those individuals streaming down the steps, taking weapons away from them? Because they would not have been afraid they would, and, and I'm not saying that the NYPD is afraid. No, 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 no. They're not physically afraid. They're afraid of getting fired, afraid of going on desk assignment, afraid of riots, afraid of politic, the, uh, the, the league of political rectumtude crawling up there. <clears throat> That's what they were afraid of. That's why they were overtaken. That's why they were overwhelmed. They're not allowed to fight back. But you see, the Israeli defense forces, the IDF could care a hang about political rectitude. They don't care. They want to win. They want to win. And you know something? They're right. You didn't want to recognize that, but it's a plain, simple historical fact. Richard Nixon was a genius. I mean, who did he make nervous by doing that? The Soviet Union, our number one enemy at the time. They started to uh, rearm and uh, it, it backed right. He was really the forerunner of Ronald Reagan by uh, opening the doors to China. Because, you know, the Soviets in China, as you know, were not getting along very well themselves. And when we started to butter, you know, get close to them, I mean, they really got nervous. But uh, oh, no, another thing, Jay, did you see the way that Rudy reacted to the press today? When the news said, uh, th this city is being run now by two white guys who know nothing of a uh, city government. So uh, what Rudy res when Rudy responded to that, saying that uh, this city has been run by white people all along for the last 40 years. Then they attacked Rudy for saying that and called him a racist. Rudy said to them, why did you attack the, uh, the paper for putting the first article in about two white guys running the city now who don't know anything about government? Well, we had a whole uh, uh, um, administration of blacks before Rudy was elected running this city. And look what it got us. By the way, where was that article? Oh, it was on the news tonight, the 11 o'clock news and the 10 o'clock news. Oh, I, I didn't, I, oh, no, I, I saw that, but, I, oh, I thought it was an article in the Daily News. I, I misunderstood you. Well, the first article was, I think that was in the news when they uh, criticized uh, this current administration. Being two white guys who are running the city yeah. in, a, uh, in a city that's uh, turning, you know, to a different color, a different diversity. Well, what does that mean, Jay? Does that mean that if it was black people in office, because uh, most of the... Uh, uh, the uh, makeup of the city now is minority, that a minority mayor would be biased in favor of them and just do what they wanted instead of what was right? Is that the way that we should run everything? See, this is when we need them. Exactly. This and is boy, is he moving fast. He's not wasting every any time in any area. And any when you um, get Bella Absug to resign and Ruth Messenger upset in the same week, you know you're doing the right thing. Uh, by the way, John, are you going to be joining us in our march on the Slave Theater on Juneteenth? <laughs> are you going to be there? I haven't heard anything about that. Oh, you didn't hear or me? Just the, just the name. Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, well, you know about the Slave Theater. Yeah. Right? Do you? You never heard about that? The Slave Theater. Oh, the Slave Theater is Sharpton's headquarters in Brooklyn. That's well, I've, I've been working nights the whole week, so I haven't heard that, your latest that's game. Where, that's where the meetings occur in the United African Movement. That's where Sharpton and, and all of the radicals and militants get together. I think they have a meeting every Wednesday night at the Slave. Whenever they have, uh, whenever they have events. <laughs> no, honestly, whenever they have 
anarchist meetings and rabble rousing <laughs> yeah, events. It's at this place called the Slave Theater. And I, yeah. I was told by somebody who should know that, that white people are not allowed in the Slave Theater. And I don't know how that can be. But anyway, I was, I was a little bit chagrined that William Powers, the state Republican chairman, has lunch on a regular basis with Sharpton. Sharpman. <laughs> yes, Albert. Yeah, he, he meets. He meets, he meets. Right, Al, Al, Albert Julius Sharpman. <laughs> he has. He meets in there, and he had lunch with him recently. He's had lunch with him before. Cuomo invites Sharpman up to Albany to to be see to seek his wisdom out. And I'm wondering if I sat down and took an IQ test, maybe my IQ would be as high as Sharpman's. How come they don't ask? How come I'm not invited to lunch with William Powers? How come I'm not invited to the governor's mansion? And and the governor invites him even after he called him a mafia dog. And even after the state wasted $5 million of the taxpayers' money for a, a baloney investigation uh, of those fraudulent charges made by Tawana Brawley, uh, of which Sharpton was the creator. So okay. why, I'm, the only reason that he merits these invitations is because he has power, and he derives his power from that mob that follows him around. So I figured I'll try to get a group of uh, toughs to follow me around. Okay. And we'll start marching on the slave theater. If you're ever invited to one of those uh, dinners, make sure you bring a food tester with you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, John. But no commitment that he'll march. On the thing, Jay. Uh, yes, Frank. Uh, Jay, there's one thing I hate, and that's divisiveness. <laughs> uh, d divisiveness is what's dividing us, and divisiveness, Jay, has become a sickness in our society. Divisiveness uh, stems from divisive words. Words can be divisive. I hate things that are uh, divisive. Now, now, let's, for example, you're going to go uh, uh, march on Juneteenth Day to the Slave Theater uh, with John of Staten Island leading the charge, Jay. There's no doubt victory is possible. But, Jay, I think the word slave is divisive. Right. I prefer a much more neutral and humane term, biological agricultural work entity. <laughs> now, you can march to the biological agricultural work entity theater, or Bowie. <laughs> and, and slave master, what a divisive term. It's divisive. I prefer work coordinator. <laughs> I, I think it is a much less divisive, divisive term. Now, Jay, I want to ask you something. What, and now, this was a revelation when I found out that uh, Hal Sharpman was really Alfred Julius Sharfman. Yes. What is his Hebraic name? Is his middle name Julius Yoyo? Oh, I'll have to find out. I'll consult the rabbi again. I'll get you his, his Jewish name. Yes, because uh, I, I wondered and, and I saw that picture of... Uh, I think it's Velvel. Velvel? Yeah. Is that his first name? Velvel Sharfman. Velvel Yoyo <laughs> Sharfman? Yeah. <laughs> and, and Jay, Jay, are you following me, Jay? Jay, I want to say this, that uh, uh, as far as Joe McCarthy goes, the only people who were affected by Joe McCarthy were those elite rats in the media in Hollywood who supported Joe Stalin before World War II. And by the way, as far as another rat, Bella Abzug, she was a member in the 1930s in the Youth Against War and Fascism, a group that supported the Stalin Act. Bella Abzug is another internationalist Soviet criminal of war who has been hiding in the woodwork of democracy. And everything that Joe McCarthy said 40 years ago has come true. Look at your media, look at your literature, look at everything about it. And the, the irony is that these uh, Stalinists are more entrenched now in the United States than they are in their land of origin. Well, that's why they're so divisive. And you know, Jake, when, you, when you talk about the counterculture, do you realize that socialism has never produced the great hallmarks of a great, a great culture? Socialism has never produced great literature, great music, or great art, because it are always used as a propagandist device for the government. And these divisive communist rats in this country, that's why the perverts and degenerates want the, the art funded for them to push their own propaganda. It's the politics of spite and jealousy wherever it's sprouted. Yes, it's the politics of divisiveness. I'm against divisiveness, so I want to end this call by reminding you from now on, let's use the term biological agricultural work entity. 
Don't give them any ideas. I have a feeling you might see that in the fiscal 96 budget. Biological Agricultural Work Entity Coordinator. <laughs> I thank you for that. I tell you, I'm going to jump. I'll say a little louder, maybe somebody will stop me. Why should I live? Oh, there's somebody coming out. Yeah, I'm going to kill myself. Why? I'm going to jump off this bridge. I swear I'm going to jump. I am. I really will. I wish he'd get closer. I may really have to jump if I just put my foot up on the ledge. Here I go. I mean it this time. Well, wait a minute, David. Why? Who are you? You want me to stop? Okay, I won't jump. David, I'm your guardian angel. No, they're not around anymore. No, David, I'm your real guardian angel. And I want to show you what the world would be like if, if you were never mayor. Oh, that's right. Yes, this will give me reason to go on, to continue, to look at all the wonderful deeds I've done. Let me take you back now, David. Let's go back to the city that you were never mayor of. What would have happened without you? Ooh. Wait, where am I? Oh, oh, I'm back in New York where I belong. Oh, yes. Hey, wait a minute. There is, there's your Uncle Rosenbaum. Hey, what's he doing there? Why, why, he's dead. He's dead and, and wait a minute. He's actually, he's walking in the street with a black man. Wait, what's going on? What's he doing? He's not supposed to be alive. He's dead. Oh, but David, you don't understand. You don't understand, David. You weren't mayor to encourage the hate mongers and to put Sonny Carson on the payroll before you were embarrassed by him and you had to cut him loose. So you see, there was nobody to stir up the hate mongers and the racists. And so Yanko Rosenbaum is alive. Oh, 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 no. Let's go somewhere else, David. Yeah, that's right. Let's go visit another area of Brooklyn. Why? Wait a minute. We're on Church Avenue. I see Koreans and, and blacks working together and, and playing together and laughing together and, and enjoying commerce together. What, what's going on? Why? Why? There, where's the boycott? But there was no boycott, David. You see, you weren't there to be mayor. And the, the mayor that was there ended it on the first day. He insisted that the law be enforced and that the protesters leave and that people learn how to get along with each other and not take out recriminations on each other. Oh, oh no, oh, oh, this is terrible. Oh, let me, let me go someplace else. Let's end this. Wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're, we're at a housing project, but wait a minute. We're at this project, but there's little children playing. Go in, children, go in. You're going to be shot. You're going to be shot. Run, run. No, David, they won't be shot. But they're all playing outside in the monkey bars and, and in the swings and in the sliding pond. And their, and their mothers are sitting there and, and people are laughing and sitting outside and playing chess. But they must leave. They must leave. They're going to be shot. Where are the dealers? But there are no dealers, David, because you weren't here to appoint Laura Blackburn to be the director of public housing. And instead of fitting her new office with with expensive luxuries and sofas and cheating the taxpayers, David, the mayor and the mayor who was here enforced the law, unlike you. And they kicked the drug dealers out of the projects. You see, you are in here to allow low-level, so-called low-level drug dealers to roam free on the streets. Drug dealers were arrested and punished, and hence they're not in the projects. Oh, oh no. Oh, this is terrible. And over there, Pappy Mason. Pappy Mason is there and and he's actually talking to, to Ed Byrne, but he had Ed Byrne killed. He had that policeman killed. Get away, Ed, get away from him. Oh, don't worry. You see, as I said, you aren't here to allow the drug merchants to roam free. You aren't here to allow the little smarmy pushers to do their dirty work. So you aren't here to protect them. Pappy now works for Mr. Gower's pharmacy. He's in the legitimate drug business. He's going to pharmaceutical school at night. And Edward Byrne is on his way to becoming a detective. Oh, no, 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 let's get out of Brooklyn. Oh, okay. But we're in Washington Heights. Where's the riot? Wait a minute, let's get out of here. There, there's a riot going to happen any minute. No, Dave, you weren't there to comfort the family of the drug dealer who was, who was killed by the policeman when the drug dealer tried to kill the policeman. 
Remember, Officer O'Keefe? You weren't here to encourage rioting, David, so there is no riot, and laws are enforced, and people don't have the idea, and wild people don't have the idea that they can get away with murder anymore. So they just adjusted themselves to the laws. Oh, no, no, let's go downtown. Take me, take me to a hospital where I can get, get some treatment. Okay, wait a minute, but this is St. Clair's, but, but where are the AIDS patients? Why aren't they lying there, dying, dying in the streets? Where are they? Where are the AIDS? Oh, no, David, there's no AIDS because you aren't here to refuse mandatory testing. You see, David, there's very little AIDS in New York now because everybody's been tested and we've purged HIV from the streets. Oh, no. No, I can't stand it anymore. I want to go back. I want to go back. I want to be mayor again. I want to be mayor again. I want to be mayor again. On WABC. That's right, Staten Island. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you didn't fall into that trap. Hey, you know, when I was moving, yeah. I, uh, I packed, I, 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 you know, I, I have to thank you for this. You sent me a beautiful cassette of Laurel and Hardy features. <laughs> and I, I, I actually stopped packing up and watched it for about two hours. It's funny, eh? Great. <laughs> Nothing like it. If you're in a bad mood, just put a Laurel and Hardy tape on, I'll tell you. That's every time, you know what I think we'll do? Anytime we are, we are, we have the activists appearing on television, we'll have to play Laurel and Hardy as the antidote. Right, it'll be like they they went nuts and they're in some kind of home with a big smile on their face all of a sudden instead of that scowl. <laughs> you know, Jay, speaking of that poor guy that's going to jail for two or three years, you know, that uh, black coach who threatened to kill the other coach and send his players out in, in the next game to punch the opposition players in the mouth, he gets suspended for one lousy game, and this poor guy is going to jail for three years for stealing an innate object like shoes. It's, it's crazy. You, you know, you'd think he was one of those thugs that clobbered uh, uh, poor Reginald Denny in the head with the brick. Yeah, he got 10 months. Yeah. Well, but, but what I don't understand is, what is he going to, you know, he better be very careful, John. You know, the, there's jailhouse justice, and the guys, yeah. up, the guys in the joint take out a lot of aggression on guys who are shoe stealers, shoe thieves. Well, I hope Marler Maples used uh, deodorizers. But, the, it, Jay, um, just to expand on your uh, opening remarks, that should be available on cassette tape now because they're such classics. You were, you were, were urging uh, people not to be corrupted by false ministers like Albert Julius Sharfman. Right. Well, Jay, I think those who would look up to or follow an Albert Julius Sharfman were corrupted and full of their own hate long before he came along. They just latched on to him because he expressed their own hatred and racism so well. And speaking of turning the victim into the perpetrator, you know, that pandering, self-hating, fat, drunken lush, Jimmy Breslin, was on with uh, Mark Simone the other morning, and he said there was no victim in the Nancy Kerrigan, uh, Tonya Harding case. It, she, it was just a prank. That was nothing. Nancy Kerrigan was just an unknown before this happened. Did he say that? Yep. He said he, he likes Tonya Harding because she's exciting. He probably thinks that Luca Brasi was exciting also. You know, if, if a white athlete attacked a black athlete with the intention of ruining his career, Jimmy Breslin would have condemned the systemized racism of whites throughout this country, and he would have said, this is nothing new, but when a white person is attacked, they're never a victim, whether the attacker is black or white. That's a great point you're making. If there were a racial aspect to it, yes, particularly if, a, if, uh, if Tanya Harding had been white and Kerrigan had been black, then the same, I, you're, I bet dollars to donuts that you're 100% right. Well, in this case, there's only a racial overtone when it comes to Jimmy Breslin's hip hypocrisy. Because, you know, he's the big champion of blacks, and he would have never dismissed this so lightly if a white had attacked a black athlete. And, Jay, I'm getting a little tired of hearing uh, blacks complain that uh, they're held back in our uh, society. Uh, they keep talking about the oppression and institutionalized racism that prevents them from achieving uh, the potential. I'll tell you what. You save it, John, and call me back. I've got a break now, and there won't be time. Okay. But you can call me back a little later. No, no, we'll I'm going to hit the up. sack now. All right, well, thanks for coming. Because I have a job. Two and I'm jobs. I'm going to do it tomorrow. All right, thank thanks. you, John. 
On w A holy moment in talk radio, yes. Our vizier, ladies and gentlemen, from Staten Island. John from Staten Island. Hello. Hi, Jay. I wish I had Sparky Lyle's old music. Remember that? Oh, Pomps and Circumstances. Yeah, Pomps and I think that's what's... I'm going to make you a little theme song. Da, 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 da. John's here to put out the fire. Yeah, but uh, one thing, though, Jay, I'm not a lefty. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and uh, I just heard that promo for Lynn's show. I'm going to remind her again. Prince Sihanouk was a communist sympathizer who gave sanctuary to the North Vietnamese, and every time we got close to their borders, he warned us not to do it. That's just as a little dig for her. But now, there's two or three things I'd like to well, do. Well, he was right. We shouldn't have been there. <laughs> I mean, he was right to keep us out. Why should we have been in Vietnam? Watch it, Jay. You're losing your identity. Hey, she doesn't scare me. <laughs> She's insignificant. That's right. <laughs> Jay, did you notice how fast Janet Reno was concerned about a couple of lesbians oh. in Mississippi? In Ovette, Mississippi, you know, you, you stole my thunder. I have it here right in front of me. Mm -hmm. Immediately, she's sending mediators there to the lesbian camp in Ovette. Go ahead, I won't. Right. Miss, Miss political correctness, she can jump right on that. But Janka Rosenbaum is still right. rotting in his grave. Beautiful. And, and she won't even move uh, to uh, find the murderers uh, of him. Now, and the other thing, Jay, the gay, along the same lines, the gay Olympics, what a ridiculous nonsense this is. Here are people who keep telling us that they just want to be treated like everyone else. But they don't, they don't want anything separate. They uh, just want uh, the same things as you and I. But yet, in every instance, they have to have their own separate uh, happening. They have to have a separate Olympics. They, need, they want their separate uh, marches and parades. So these are people who inevitably show their hypocrisy and uh, what liars they are. Thirdly, Rudy Giuliani is taking it in the neck right now because he dared to say that crime is a civil rights issue. Yeah. Well, Go ahead. Once again, the, the black community trips itself up and exposes their paranoia and hypocrisy. Rudy didn't say that uh, he was going to go after black crime. He said crime is a civil rights issue. Now, when... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all those blacks who took exception to that remark, betraying the fact yeah, that... they feel uh, guilty. I don't understand. understand. Why did they think it was directed to them? I, I wonder why. So, you know, those who keep reminding us that they're the victims of most crime when they're looking for sympathy are more worried about what might look bad. They're more concerned about image than getting rid of those who they say they're the victims of. They want to stop being victims, but not if it means... Uh, incarcerating minorities. And uh, thirdly, uh, thirdly, uh, fourthly, fourthly, I guess. Fourthly, fourthly. <laughs> there was a black student, Jay, in southeastern Missouri State College. And beaten to death by hazing in a yeah. hazing ritual. Right. Beaten raw from shoulder to knees. Now, if right. this had been white students performing this lynching, we'd have marches, especially during Black Mythology Month, There'd be marches all over this country, and, protesting. And, and John, that particular fraternity had been cited before by the Hellenic Association in Missouri for hazing rituals that resulted in injuries prior to this. Well, that's what we get, Jay, when we're afraid to approach any illegal institution in which blacks happen to belong to us. But the fact is, there have been hazing incidents with white fraternities where there have been deaths when they, when they drink four quarts of cheap gin. I've heard that, so I don't think it's... It's limited to the, the black fraternity, in fairness. I just know that if it was whites that had done this, we'd be, there'd be a, but, a revolution in this country right now, but you, you, the especially point, with the atmosphere. I like your first point best about the lesbian camp in Old Vet, Mississippi, John. A lot of people might not know what you're referring to. There's mm -hmm. these uh, lesbians. There's a picture of one of them in the New York Times. Uh, she looks a little like the, well, this, did you see her? They have Sherry Michael working on a drainage cover at the camp. They went down to the middle of the Bible Belt in an act of outright hostility and made this uh, Sister Spirit lesbian camp. They call it Sister Spirit. It's a 180-bed dormitory. Mm. And they put it in the middle of the Bible Belt, and the townsfolk are aghast at the presence yeah. of such an institution there. And they, they've just been telling them they don't want them there. So Janet Reno, I guess Janet Reno feels close to them for stuff. She feels a kinship with them. <laughs> yeah. 
and she wants to, uh, she immediately sent federal investigators down there to protect the civil rights of the lesbians in the middle of the Bible Belt. Uh, but you're right, where was she for three years? Where was she, well, since she's sworn in, where was she for one year with respect to the federal investigation and the death of Yankel Rosema? She had to be led kicking and screaming. But you know something, John? I'm making a prediction I've never made before. I have a vibe. I have a feeling. Janet Reno will be let go from the Clinton administration probably before the end of this year. Well, there's a long list of people that's going to have to be let go no. because every, every appointment this man has made has turned out to uh, have this... Uh, same type of uh, propinquity and, uh, you know, with their one-sidedness. My, uh, my sources tell me the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee has very little use for her, as do some other key senators, and that the administration will cut Janet Rhino loose before the end of 1994. One final thing, Jay. Uh, this has nothing to do with the, the previous topic, but uh, I said this before uh, Mr. Uh, Cutting Edge. He had an, uh, an editorial on it. Hey, what did we do before him? Huh? What did we do? How did we exist? <laughs> I heard that the other day. That was funny. And the caller didn't get what but the, uh, <laughs> the sarcasm of Bob. But um, the moment I heard this, I said, this is a payback. Thank God for George Bush and Ronald Reagan. They just saved uh, a couple hundred thousand more jobs. The $6 billion aircraft deal that yeah. the Saudis made with U.S. companies. Right. This is because we saved their oil that would be uh, now under the control of Saddam Hussein. Seventy percent of the oil's world supply would be under his control if we didn't uh, protect their oil. And John, France... This is a payback. France, the European community, desperately wanted at least half of that deal, but we got it all. Thank God. Who needs right. them anyway? To... John, Thank I gotta run. Skunks, thanks. All right. John, on Stat John from Staten Island on WABC with Jay Diamond. Uh, Hi, Jay. There he is, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jay. Jay, before I get to my uh, point, uh, a latest New York City scandal update. Prisoners in the New York City prison system were allowed to make $3.2 million worth of unauthorized phone calls in 1993 at the expense of the New York City taxpayers. And when Catherine Bates, the affirmative action head of the system, was asked about this, she said, quote, we're working on it. Yeah, I'll bet she's working on getting them uh, touch tone and cellular phones. But uh, once again, Jay, Ronald Reagan and George Bush were responsible for New York City's financial problems. I mean, we have one scandal a week coming out now. I could go down a whole new list, but there's no time. And secondly, Jay, we can blame any problems we've had with the CIA or the FBI since J. Edgar Hoover died. Uh, you know, corruption, agents gone bad, or uh, bundled investigations, etc. Once again, you can blame it on liberals who demanded that uh, the CIA and the FBI uh, be hampered and stifled in the aftermath of uh, Watergate and the Vietnam War. Stifled! Excuse me? Nothing, go ahead. <laughs> This is what it's led to, Jay. Can you imagine if Ronald Reagan didn't come along and uh, take some of these restrictions off to restore them at least uh, to uh, halfway decent uh, organizations? And uh, I, I expected this to come along, and eventually it, uh, it, it hampered us. And uh, thirdly, Jay, you were speaking to Norman Siegel about Rudy's great plan to grab these thugs and punks off the street and put them back into school where they belong. And he said, why don't they go after real crime? Well, you see, it just goes to show how liberals have no insight, and that's why they shouldn't even be entitled to an imp opinion. See, I'm going to give them a taste of their own medicine. We should just silence them. That's what they want to do to anyone who disagrees with them. The, right. These punks who are committing the real crimes half the time. I want to start a right-wing club. A real right, rightist club. How can we do that? You don't have to start a right-wing club, Jay. We're mean? out. We're out here. Don't worry. In force. Yeah, but I want to get together and have meetings, make speeches. <laughs> no, I don't want to be anything like liberals. That's what they do. I just want Americans to be themselves and win this battle legitimate instead of, you know, just 
haranguing and uh, trying to shout people down. I guess that contradicts what I said a moment ago. But of course, I say things out of anger. And you really can't blame conservatives because liberalism has truly been proven to be a mental disease. And these 63 members of the House, Jay, were a lot of them white liberals that voted not to uh, condemn Khalid Mohammed. Do you, do you happen to know? What's that? Well, a lot of the uh, members of the House and the Senate that yeah. refused to condemn Khalid Mohammed's speech, yeah. were they white liberals? No, I'm, uh, I'm sorry to tell you, there were some very prominent conservatives in that list, mm -hmm. which uh, now, I, of course, that you mention it, I can't find. Why can't I ever? If I had it right in front of me a second ago, but my desk, the console here is so cluttered because I didn't clean it up after I did Bob's show today. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah. I'm looking for it now, but I, <laughs> I can tell you from memory that you'll be shocked to know that Congressman Tim Penny was on the list. Bob Dornan also? And Bob Dornan as well. Bob, uh, B-1 didn't uh, vote in favor. Oh, here it is. All B-1 did was he, he voted present, but that put him in the same category as, uh, as um, let's see, Pete McCloskey. Well, he is a liberal. Oh. Uh, Gary Studs. Yeah. Gary Studs just voted present. Now, that's very interesting that Gary Studs would vote present because he, as you know, is a radical homosexual. And, uh, <laughs> well, he is yeah. homosexual. I mean, these names, Harvey Milk, uh, Andy Hum, Gary Studs. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> even the names sound peculiar. You know what I mean, Jay? Yeah, odd, right? I know. Yeah. It is true. They have these, been... <laughs> Tell me that these people... You try and tell me about Donald that. Donald Suggs. <laughs> Another one. Yeah. I forgot all about him. Tell me these people are normal. I think they. The sound of their name is off the wall. You know what I think? I think they take these names because they want to convert being a homosexual into being an ethnic group. <laughs> They're always saying that we are an oppressed ethnic group. Well, I think what they do is they they change their names around so the names sound gay. Yeah. The way people have Jewish names, like Irving Schwartz. <laughs> and Albert Julius Scharfman. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, Jay, it, it proves that a politician is just a politician all the time. And what this also says, Jay, is that these people really believe what I believe and what so many other people who have a little bit of guts and speak out believe. That a majority, they must, if they're going to vote that way, not to condemn Khalid Mohammed. How could you not condemn a speech like that? They must believe, in other words, they're thinking of constituency first. Yeah. They must believe that a majority of folks out there are vicious, anti-American, anti-Semitic, racist. Well, and if they go against them, they'll lose their votes. Well, I, I can tell you that Dornan voted the same way Kwisa Mpume voted. That's one of the, probably one of the first votes in the House of Representatives where B-1 voted on the same side as Kouiza and Fume. Yeah, it's an outrage. I'd string every one of them up. And uh, Gary Studs, he voted not, but the, the radical homosexuals are always saying, we're an oppressed ethnic group, our struggle is like the black struggle, and yet, how come he doesn't have any empathy when uh, Khalid Mohammed says he wants to kill people, dig them up and kill them again because they didn't die hard enough? And uh, I think he also insulted homosexuals too, so I guess, Gary Studd must have some ideological reason to have voted, to have abstained rather than voted to condemn. Well, Jay, we must always be aware of the trickery of this radical homosexual group. They are constantly trying to align themselves with people who they don't belong being aligned with because this is their trickery. They try and gain sympathy. Doctor, but we're on to them. Doctor, uh, how would you characterize them? Would you say that... Uh, how would you characterize their personality? Vicious. Devious. How about say uh, that? Devious. Vicious. Vile. Devious. <laughs> <laughs> they are devious, sneaky, and we've always got to be on the lookout for them. <laughs> yeah, you're one of the great talents I've ever known in my life. You know that? That is a great imitation. Nobody can compare to you. No, no, no. That really is. Who's the other one you do that's great? Now, you do so many that are but you do Laurel and Hardy great. You do Dr. Hurwitz. I think Dr. Hurwitz may be your greatest creation. Oh, he's fun. He's fun. He's, uh... I mean, yeah, he's, that's a great image. That really sounds like man it. is never at a loss for words. No, he's terrific. He'll, he'll, you can uh, interview him for 10 hours. 
Uh, he never gets tired. I was speaking to Dr. Howard. <laughs> that made your trap creep. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you, John. You. On WABC, to be true, wait a minute. On the very day that he's in, gets inducted into the, uh, voted into the, the Hall of Fame, it's impossible that we'd really have the, uh, the scooter Phil Rizzuto. I can't believe it. I have to ask Bill White. Uh, well, that's true, Scooter. I uh, believe you are on the air now. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Now, if White is telling it to me, then it's got to be true. Uh, Scooter, <laughs> I don't think... Hey, Jay, no, you did that real good. I, was, I thought that was me talking there for a oh, minute. Oh, unbelievable. <laughs> How you doing? Phil, I am so elated. I'm so thrilled. Congratulations and God bless you, Phil. Uh, thank you very much, Jay. You know, you, you know... We listen to you and Bob all the time. There, there are times when you imitate him that I say, hey, there's Bob. Bob Grant just, you were doing it the other night. <laughs> when, when you said, when are they going to get rid of this music? Are we? <laughs> oh, yeah, you heard that? Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> well, let me tell you, if anybody would have told me that Phil Rizzuto listens to me, I, oh, I, it I just boggles my mind. I know you did, but it's just unbelievable. I mean, you know how far I go back with you? There was one back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back homers with Jerry Lumpy, Norm Seaburn, and I can't remember, I don't know who it was. Who It was Jerry, it was. It had to be in 1958. 58. Lumpy, Norm Seaburn, and guys, there were... Guys you'd never think of, right? No, right, and three in a row, right. Back-to-back-to-back yeah. -to -back -to -back homers, and, and you called it. Uh, that must have been your first year in the broadcasting booth. Second. Second. Incredible. I feel so great. The only thing is they should have voted you in there about seven times because it's long overdue. God bless you. Yeah, well, you wait for these things, and they, they feel a lot better when you wait so long. Well, why do, what do you think kept you out for so long? Was it the writers? What was it? Well, I can't, you know, I can't tell for sure, Jay, but, uh, you know, my stats kind of uh, paled compared to the uh, stats of the real Hall of Famers, you know? No, 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 but, but you all... Yogi uh, told us, told us that I was in the Hall of Fame. You know, I got scared because I read in the paper, Phil, that the two of your real supporters, two of your most ardent yeah, supporters, that's right. Stan Musial, had, his wife just had surgery, right. he couldn't vote, and, and of course the splinter yeah. was recovering from a minor stroke. Right. So I was afraid, uh, wait, I gotta go back into this voice, I was afraid that would neutralize yeah. <laughs> the new guys on there who, who would vote for you. No, that's true. Oh, <laughs> unbelievable, but I think that, you know, and, and one of the things you said that impressed me, Scooter, was that they asked, well, who would the, everybody keeps saying, well, I voted for him every year, I voted for him, I voted for him, and you, <laughs> you said, if all these guys had voted for me, I'd be in there 20 years ago. Right, right. Well, well, it's good talking to you. Well, you're in there now. Yeah. I really, I really want to salute you, wish you luck, God bless you, and I'll see you up at the stadium. I'm certain they'll work it out. All right, Jay. Uh, let me tell you something. You're one of the reasons I wanted to get behind a microphone in my life. Well, I tell you, you're behind there a lot now. You put a lot of hours in there. I you really know your stuff. Yes. Yes. No, no you listen. Kidding. I know. I mean, geez. Oh, unbelievable. <laughs> I, I tell you, I, you know, so that's right. I'm like a workhorse. I, I'm like a throwback to red roughing. Or something right. Like that. Absolutely. That's right. I'd probably be pitching both ends of a doubleheader. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, Jay. Thank you, Phil. Good luck, and I'll see you in the uh, spring. Okay. Lady. Almost a full moon. And the pitch to Reggie. That's gone tight for Holy Cow! Up the deck job for Reggie Jackson, and that quickly the ball game is tied up. Holy Cow, there was no doubt about that one. And that, what you hear there, is the reason why Phil Rizzuto was a Hall of Famer and All-Star as a ball player, and a Hall of Famer and All-Star as, uh, as a broadcaster, because he threw his heart to his work. He never held back. He gave it everything he had on the ball field and in the booth, and he still does it on WABC. Yes. Hi. Uh, yes. The Frank. Yes. The great Frank. Oh, Ladies and gentlemen, a true stalwart, uh, a man who's distinguished himself, not just on, on this show, but somebody who's known clear across the dial and known for a good reason because, his, ladies and gentlemen, his commentaries are pungent, brilliant, introspective, and mind-opening. Frank, that's my little tribute to the great Frank from Queens, otherwise known as Vintage Frank. Thank you. I wanted to say that uh, Monday night they rounded up the usual suspects. You know, the drug addicts, the alcoholics, the 
sexual degenerates, the pedophiles, the, uh, the lowest elements of society. Where was this, in the White House? No, in the Academy Awards. Oh. Good friends of the White House. And, you know, they had Beulah Johnson. Uh, that's Whoopi Goldberg's real name. Uh, Beulah Johnson was up there emceeing the uh, Academy Awards. And the only political joke that Beulah made was about Bob Dole. A tasteless, disgusting remark commiserate with her total lack of talent. And not one, not one joke about the Clintons, about Whitewater. Now, if you remember the Academy Awards year after year when Bush was president, President Bush rather, there was a multiplicity of tasteless, baseless, vile, and disgusting remarks, so-called jokes that were made again about Dan Quayle. Robin uh, Williams, the uh, cocaine addict, came on one year as the idiot that he is wearing Mickey Mouse the ears and white gloves and continually bashed Dan Quayle. And I wonder, could it be that uh, the people that are in Hollywood are actually uh, uh, biased uh, in favor of Clinton and they're afraid to exercise their supposedly wonderful satirical wit? And, you know, if you've been watching Murphy Brown, not one show, not one show, not one remark, not one offhand joke about the debacle from Arkansas Hillbilly Bill or his wife, the $100,000 woman Hillary. Only one show that they've had so far about the, the, the cat socks where Murphy Brown supposedly kidnaps them. You know, there's such a bias in the media. It is so blatant that the Hollywood crowd is viciously, viciously biased against conservatives, against the Republicans, and they're so pro-Clinton that it, it really stinks. Worse than that, Frank, biased against the truth. Yes, yes. And I want to tell you, I want to expound on something you were saying about uh, Boutros uh, Ghali and the United States and Somalia. Right. We better watch that we don't stumble into a conflict on the Korean Peninsula because of the Atomic Energy Agency and because Clinton, being the devious one that he is, may see that if it begins to get too hot about white water, knowing he can unite the American people behind him, will get us involved in a war on the Korean Peninsula. It is not our business to be there in the first place. There's no threat from the Soviet, the old Soviet right. Union. South Korea does what South Korea wants. If you remember a few years back, they were doing a very brisk business with America's arch enemy, Colonel Gaddafi. The South Koreans are doing what's good for them. There are 38,000 U.S. boys over there. They're going to be sacrificial lambs. Maybe the war would last two or three weeks because uh, Kim Il-sung, uh, his supplies are limited. That's right. But why? And, right, and don't sacrifice American boys. Get and those boys out of Not only that, from what I read, the communist Chinese are, are a little itchy about having him with atomic weapons on their continent. Uh, and moreover, Frank, there's 17 million people in North Korea in total. I think there's 42 million people in South Korea. Their economy in North Korea has been strangled for years. Uh, the fact is they're going to fall of their own weight in another couple of years. We don't have to. I, don't, I, I think it would be unwise to start a Korean war now. But, but, uh, but it would be in the interest of this president. Yes, and that's why I say, America, watch out for Bill Clinton. Your sons may be fighting in Korea because he thinks it's going to sell, uh, save his political career. Well, why not kick the U.N. out of here altogether? That's right. Put it where it belongs, in Tunis. That's right. S send them over to the third world where they belong, where they can <laughs> live with flies and uh, goats in their uh, house, what they're used to. But I, I am telling you something, Frank. Remember, keep in your mind the vision of that American soldier being dragged through those streets and ask, for what? That's right. For what? Why is he a leader today, but he was a warlord in October? Well, because Bill Clinton knows how to, uh, how to twist the public. I, I saw that press conference, and you were right. That's what I said. I said, where was the question about the $100,000 that she right. gave off? I can't believe The only one who didn't roll over and play dead was Brit Hume. That's right. And did you see how nasty Clinton spoke? To he him? always is. All right, thank you, Jake. Thank you, Frank. As Bob would say, vintage Frank. And Doug... ...houses where the elderly white women were set on by uh, pre-adolescent and adolescent black youths. Well, we don't know yet that it's a biased crime. In fact, it's highly unlikely it's a biased crime. Well, how do you know that? Well, because traditionally, biased crimes are when whites attack blacks. And we all know that happens to a far greater degree than the other way around. Why, this poor fellow Wilson down in Florida six months ago, 
every night it was on the network news for a month when he was testifying against those two whites who viciously abducted him and tried to set him on fire. Now, since that time, there have been absolutely no real documented attacks of blacks attacking whites. It's always the other way around. And that's as it should be, because that way we can condemn it. If, for a chance, that a black were once in a blue moon emboldened to attack a white person because they were white, well, this would upset the apple trap. We would be afraid to condemn it. Well, why would you be afraid to condemn it? Because I shrink from confrontations and Sharpton might call me a mafia dog, and I would be upset if he called me that. I wouldn't protest it. I'd have to take it the way I, I bend over for Sharpton, no matter what his demands. Well, I understand that. I understand that. But uh, how could you characterize this attack as anything other than a biased attack? Entirely possible, Jay. And I speak from 12 years as governor. 12 Y-E-A-H-Z years of specific knowledge in the field of violent crime. And I can tell you it's most likely nothing more than a case of, of youths who decided to attack old women. Happens all the time, at least since I've been governor. All right, thank you very much. Work to your satisfaction, Kevin, while I have Bob on the line. How does it sound? The hum. Kevin says, once the hum is... And, and Bob, Kevin assures me that slight little hum will be gone Monday. Oh, really? So it'll be perfect, but it does sound good. All right, well, that's good, because Monday I will be on after the... after oh, the Texas that's... Rangers defeat the New oh, York Inevitables. Bad. Yeah, yeah, it's baseball season already. Oh, boy, yeah, I, I looked at the schedule. The, the people, I don't know if they're going to like it. There's a couple of day games in April, Bob. Yeah, quite a few day games. They should have you go out there and do color commentary at the stadium. Yeah, I'd like to do that. I'd like, maybe I could get a word in edgewise with Sterling. <laughs> it is high, it is high, it is God! <laughs> hey, somebody tells me this year you're going to relent and you're actually going to deign to appear at the stadium. You are yes, going to go up. I'm going to go to the stadium. I'm going to go to the stadium. Uh, I see they have 81 home games. Uh -huh. I'll be there for about 78 home games, that's all. That's it. <laughs> you know, I, 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 this is the year that I least understand baseball. They have three divisions. I don't know what teams are what. They haven't been. Now they have wild cards. You don't even really have to finish first in your division to get into the playoffs. I don't like it. Well, of course, the World Series will begin December 14th. Everybody knows yeah, right. that. Right, right, right. And uh, they'll be playing on a tundra. No, it's ridiculous. Absolutely. Hey, listen, you know why, Jay? I'll tell you why. You want to know why? Yes. I'll tell you why. <laughs> because there's so many Gabons in America whose lives are so empty. They want to fill that emptiness by being spectators at sporting events. And, and not only that, that's true. But uh, this way, if they tack on another five or six weeks to the season and a couple of more layers of playoffs, Bob, the players that are only getting $32 million on a four-year contract can now get $36 million. <laughs> It's so ludicrous. I... <laughs> hey, wait, Madam Hillary, Madam Hillary is in charge in the White House. North Korea is building nuclear bombs. And the Middle East is in turmoil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what was the big story for 48 hours? That the Dallas Cowboys have a new coach. That's right, that's right, a new coach. And uh, they've gone from one egomaniac to another egomaniac. I'm uh, so out of touch, Bob, I thought, I said, gee, the Cowboys had a new coach? Gosh, that's, I guess that's, the, that's it for Tom Landry. I'm five years behind. <laughs> I don't know about it. So that's all the news. I've got a great letter to read. You should listen, because I'm going to read you a letter that I got from an inmate on Rikers Island. Now, really? Let, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, and, a, and a, a beautifully crafted letter. And it's interesting. I don't, yeah, he told me that story, yeah. yeah. He, uh, he said that she was a, a very compliant uh, oh, employee. Oh, wonderful, wonderful young woman. Sweet, demure. With a lot of suggestions for the staff. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Yeah. Not presumptuous at all. No, sweet, no. very sweet. That's good. Yeah. Good. I wish I could have been there with you fellas. Uh, Jay, it would have been complete. <laughs> it would have been complete. Are we on? Remember, <laughs> Are we on? I don't know why, Jay, but I feel so silly. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> silly, absolutely silly. Well, maybe it's that bad. 
Now, you know, it is, it's being with you because uh, you are such a luminary. You, uh, you, your talent uh, your dwarfs uh, any room you walk into. You dwarf it. <laughs> He's laughing at me, folks. The word dwarf. See? Say dwarf. I idolize the man and no, he laughs at me. dwarf. Let me hear you say dwarf. Dwarf. <laughs> Even that is fun. <laughs> you want to see me make him laugh? I want to show you how easy. This is for all the callers at home who are intimidated by Bob. You want to you want to disarm him? There are two things to do. These are here are the two things. Bob's getting mad, so all you have to do is say, "Oh, I see you're becoming very irritated." That's what I'm <laughs> saying, Mr. Grant. Perhaps perhaps we could allay some of your inflammatory emotions with a nice delousing treatment. <laughs> would you please follow me into this room? You could do that, and he it'll all all his ire will evaporate. And then if, if I then so then you see. A simple reorientation of syllables into, into a Prussian state of speech, and the man disintegrates into a little puddle, reminiscent of a small child losing control in paroxysms of laughter. You're, because of, because of your insolence, there will be no Christmas twees. The old von Scherbach's for cavalrymen. Now, please assist me as I put on my boots. <laughs> Wait, then there's another way. So if that, well, that will work. But if, you know, Bobby, he's laughing. Five minutes later, he could be mad at you again. But so here's, here is another <laughs> fail-safe system for disarming him in the moment, in the existential moment of Bob's irritation. So figure you're on the phone with him, and you're a real gavon. You're a real boorish, unlettered slob. <laughs> and he loses patience with you. And all of a sudden, so you, you change like this. So you see, Bob, that's what I was saying. Like I said, Bob, we got to get tough with these people and throw everybody out of the country. You know what I'm saying, Bob? <laughs> you understand? Like, you know, I know you agree with me, Bob, because you and I think alike. I understand, Bob, that you and I are on the same wavelength. Don't worry about it, Bob. And I realize you take a lot of pride, like a guy like me agrees with you, Bob. So now Bob's getting disgusted because he's listening to, you know, Bob, he's, he's got a keen aesthetic sense. And even if he, you know, he, if he's not inclined to dispute you, if you sound like this, Bob, you know, he's going to get irritated. So <laughs> instead of that, you say, so like I was saying, Bob, you know, I understand now. I sense you're quiet. You're getting a little, you lose the patience with me. Oh, I stop talking like that, and I begin to talk like this. <laughs> Mr. Grant, is it not true that you asked for this equipment to be installed some six months ago? <laughs> and is it not true that there were numerous delays, none of which, of course, were due to your own insufficiency? But is it not true that at that time, you misrepresented the schedule of your moving, that when you finally moved, you moved a day later, and that now, as then, you are a chronic and habitual liar! <laughs> there he goes. So that's it, folks. The man can't stay mad at you if you do those two things. It's very simple. <laughs> well, tomorrow, if you hear his patience beginning to wane, if you hear him fidgeting, or if you can, you picture him getting irritated, if he goes, uh-huh, mm-hmm, uh-huh, okay. And if he starts to pour water, then you know to use those two voices. And he'll stop pouring the water, and he'll be laughing. Oh, oh I'm all worn out, Jay. All right. I'm all worn out. All right, so uh, I'll be listening tomorrow at 3.07. All right, Jay. All right. Thank you, Jay. Hey, look, thank you. It sounds good. It doesn't. Kevin says it will be letter perfect by Monday a.m. I believe Kevin. All right. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Hey, no, let me seriously, it was a big treat. Maybe you can do this more often now that you're at home. You've got this equipment. I don't know if I could take it, though. You have me laughing. I'm doubled up here. Well, well let you do all the opens. That's the hardest part of any show. Oh. So every night you can come, you can do the open. I'm worn out, Jay. I'm worn out from laughing. <laughs> all right, I'll see you tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, that love America everywhere. John from Staten Island. Hello, John. Thank you, Jay. I'm uh, proud to be first to open up your program tonight. Great monologue as usual. Jay, uh, I am. Uh,
getting a little fed up with these uh, uh, black racists and white anarchists that are conducting this systemized campaign against Rudy Giuliani because he's done all the right things. These are the same hypocrites who say that there's a, a campaign being conducted against Bill Clinton because they can't stand the fact that he was elected president. Well, they can't stand the fact that Rudy Giuliani has been elected mayor and their racist thug of a mayor was thrown out on his ear as he should have been. And one of them is this vicious uh, Chris the Creep who said he's going to call you tonight. You know, he hates the police and the, the white anarchists hate the police because they're the last uh, bastion that we have against anarchy. The black anarchy that wishes to take over this nation and turn it into a black nation. That's why they hate the police and they're conducting this campaign. And it's about time that we uh, force these students that, or these thugs that we call students into the classroom. These are the same hypocrites who say, Jay, that blacks aren't getting an education and it's the school's fault and the teacher's fault. Right, so wait. if you're not in the classroom, how can right. you get an education? Oh, wait, wait, wait. And, and it's the, the best thing is, if you build a prison, that causes people to become criminals. <laughs> That's the, we're building all these prisons. We should be building, I don't know what should we build, what we should be building. We're not supposed to build prisons because somehow, once you build a prison, this somehow does something to, to people's minds and they have to break the law in order to fill the prisons up. But, but, but let me tell you something, John. I, uh, I disagree with you because I believe that the last place these professional hoodlums should be is in a classroom, pre preventing uh, decent children from learning. Remember, uh, you cannot really see this as a totally uh, racial divide. This poor kid, Rashad King, uh, from everything I read, is it was a fine young man. And he was killed by somebody I would call a big, ugly, dumb freak. But I wouldn't say freak if I weren't on the radio. And uh, the guy that killed him was black. And so this is, I think you are, you are in error. If you try to characterize this movement as, as, as a movement part if, where all blacks are participating. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't say all blacks, but the ones who are conducting this campaign are mainly black. No, there are a lot of embittered, vicious, stupid people uh, who are black and who, who hate the United States with all their heart. And they are Ben Chavis, Jesse Jackson, all these people in operation. Eric and all And Eric Adams and, and Khalid Abdul Muhammad and his ilk. All of these people who, uh, who tend to appear at gang summits leading the gangs on. And don't forget, the man in the White House, this, this individual in the White House invited the Crips and the Bloods to his inauguration. Well, that's fitting. He's a 1960s freak. And uh, the, the other thing, I lost my train of thought for a second, Jay. Uh, Lynn said earlier that the students should be getting, each student should have their own computer. Yeah, so they can be stolen again like they were the last time. And then she had a caller last night who said, the students aren't getting any books. A black caller, of course. Yeah, they're not getting any books because the school's board... Yeah, but I heard a black caller called in last night and tell Lynn she was full of beans. That, yeah, they're uh, in the minority, though, Jay. One, but, them, one but, but, in, but. in ten million. And they'll be called an Uncle Tom. Well, no, that's true. Rudolph Monroe told me he's called an Uncle Tom, but he's a Vietnam veteran, as you are. Maybe you met him there. And he's a, he's a heck of a guy. I, I'm, sh I'm sure he is. But uh, the, the point th is, the point is, the gang culture is insidious, John, and it is aided and abetted, and it is applauded and empowered by individuals such as Chavis, Jesse Jackson, and this Janice Miller and Push, and all the other, and people like Sharpton, who have a, a very sneaky, nefarious reason for wanting to cultivate gangs and the rise of gangs, because they realize that the gangs are a cancer that will consume this country. Well, Jay, where, where are all the demonstrations, by the way, by the black community against the murder of this yeah. black young man on the train? That's exactly right. Where's, well, where's the black demonstrations? Rudolph, the fellow from Chicago, Rudolph Monroe, said last night that when, when uh, they, they, they march at the drop of a hat, but if a black kills a black, suddenly they don't care about it. And, and why wasn't Sharpton busy visiting this family? No, where was he today? He was, uh, he was having a party with gangs. It's only when they can make political hay, when they can, uh, when they can make get whitey political hay, then they're out there demonstrating. It's they a, don't care about black people, just like they don't care that Clarence Thomas and, uh, and uh, Colin Powell went as high as you can get uh, in this country without becoming president. But they don't care about them because they don't have the right political angle. Hypocrites. Thanks, Jay. Thanks.
Thank you, John. On the conference, direct from Chicago. That's right, you didn't know when you tuned in tonight. But ladies and gentlemen, here is a tape recording of today's first annual J. Diamond Annual Gang Summit and Postal Delivery Conference. Uh, the first annual meeting of the Coalition for Gang Harmony will now come to order. Our first order of business will address the attempts being made by Jews and other European Americans to keep you, my brothers, from working at the post office. Now, how to address the situation is the grand high, I mean, here to address it is the high exalted mystic muggity muck, the all supreme keeper of the secret handshake and hand usher at the slave theater that is head usher, the Honorable Tojan Muhammad. Malona Lickham, my brothers, high sign. Brothers, as you know, the oppression we have faced for the past 6,000 years have prevented us from our goals and mired our many accomplishments. Not since the Jews bombed Pearl Harbor have we seen a more oppressive regime come upon our times. The authorities bombard us with the, with the corruptive paraphernalia and the Jew makes us take drugs. In Chicago, the story is different. Thanks to people like the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, we have done what was once unthinkable the Chicago Post Office Pilot Gang Delivery Program, and I'm living proof of its success. They said it couldn't be done, but we did it. They said, you have to know how to read to deliver letters, but we delivered them anyway. <laughs> you see, society doesn't appreciate the basic fundamental precept behind our fundraising activities, and that one simple rule is the check is in the mail. Now, we all know that Social Security checks get mailed out once a month, which also coincides with our own monthly fund drives. As our pilot program in Chicago allows us direct access to the financial assistance that six million years of oppression has denied us, it also helps in reducing crime within the community. By allowing us direct access, this program eliminates the need to knock old people upside the head as often and thereby reducing crime. Our proposal is to expand on this by placing the United States Post Office under direct command of Ben Chavis and the Nation of Islam. We would take the jobs that have been denied us by six trillion years of oppression and divide gang turf by zip code. This would eliminate the need for excessive drive-by shooting. And now I would like to introduce Brother Schlamil. He has something to say about those two Japanese students that got killed last month. Bologna Lickham. The recent shooting and consequent death of two Japanese students in California last month was most unfortunate. We thought they was Korean. All right, on WAD. You know, Joe McCarthy, God bless him. God bless Joe McCarthy, who truly, truly has, history has vindicated, despite 40 years of lying, filthy, left-wing propaganda. Joe McCarthy exposed the termites that were hiding in the woodwork of democracy. For as a top KGB agent came out today and said, one of Lenin's useful idiots of the West, brilliant, though he might have been far beyond anything we can imagine, Robert Oppenheimer and Rico Fermi and that ilk gave the Soviet Union our plans for the atomic bomb. You know, I'm a great believer in alternate history. Could you imagine, Jay, how history would have been had thought that beast Stalin not gotten a hold of the atom bomb? Eastern Europe would have been freed over 40 years ago. There would have never been a Korean War. There would have been no war in Southeast Asia. Uh, communist China would have never happened. So instead, those who thought that by selling out to the Soviets, to those thugs, by giving them secrets of the atom bomb to be, as the liberals like to call it, even-handed, condemn three quarters of the world's population to over 40 years of the most unimaginable suffering there was. Well, I don't know uh, if, it, if it pays to play guessing games, but here's a sobering one, Frank. What if... Uh Hitler's scientists had come up with it maybe six months before we did. That's right. And put it on those V-2 missiles. That's right. What then? <laughs> you know, speaking of Hitler, do you remember those uh, movies where they'd show those brown shirts on campus when a Jewish professor would get up to speak and they'd immediately begin chanting, Juden, Juden, Juden. Do you remember that? They still do it in, uh, in the United States. In Howard University. They'll be at it tomorrow there, do you know? Yeah, yeah. But let me tell you something. There's a meeting down there tomorrow. I, I want to know one thing. 
Yeah. Why is it Janet Reno can send out uh, federal agents to protect lesbians at Camp Sister Spirit right. in Mississippi, but she can't send them out to protect that Jewish professor's right to speak on our campus before those brown shirts at Howard University? Well, you're talking about Professor David Byron Davis, who had to postpone a lecture that was scheduled for uh, about two weeks ago at Howard University. Now, he is an individual who, he is a professor, a scholar, who converted to Judaism uh, many years ago, uh, but because of fears of how he would be received on campus, he was asked by the administrator of Howard, of Howard, Paul Logan, who is an associate dean for the humanities down there at Howard University, to postpone his visit till next fall. I don't understand why Dean Logan assumes that next fall the uh, reception for David Byron will be more hospitable than it will be uh, this April. I don't understand that, but do you know who is going to be speaking at Howard tomorrow night? No. Uh, on one list, this is the guest list for one night. You ready? This yeah. is tomorrow, a rally. This is, uh, this is a rally tomorrow sponsored by the Unity Nation, who sponsored the previous rally where the anti-Semitic epithets were, were uh, chanted. Tomorrow night, Khalid Muhammad, uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Tony Martin of Wellesley, and Malik Zulu Shabazz, the Howard Law student who led the uh, anti-Jewish chanting at the rally in February. That's a racist uh, minstrel show that they're going to have over there. Wh where is Janet Reno? And God bless you, Joe McCarthy. Uh, you were right. Janet Reno tonight is busy erasing the state of Georgia from every map that she owns. Well, the look, it took him over 30 years to get Byron Della Beckwith. Well, well but, uh, you know, she doesn't want to know where Georgia is because Lemrick Nelson lives there now. And uh, it seems he's, Lemmerich's gotten himself into a little trouble. Isn't that, isn't that surprising? Nah. All right. Thanks, Frank. Me a tribe of Crease. You too. <laughs>